Hey everyone, welcome back to the Kaderna Podcast. I'm your host, Brian Kaderna. This is the show where we discuss all things wealth, in its original meaning, a state of well-being. Wherever you're listening or watching, please subscribe and feel free to leave us a review. That's how we keep on spreading the good word. In today's episode, I get to interview Jerry Williams. If you're not familiar with who she is, let me give you a quick bio. Jerry Williams served for 26 years as a special agent with the FBI. During most of her bureau career, she worked major economic fraud investigations, including schemes and deceptions that con artists and corrupt corporate and public officials devised to steal other people's money. She now uses her professional experience as a crime fiction author and relives her glory days through the show FBI Retired Case File Review, a true crime podcast with over 10 million downloads where she interviews retired FBI agents about their high-profile cases and careers. Jerry is currently under contract as a technical consultant for major TV networks and production companies that want to create an authentic FBI drama and characterization. You may have seen her on shows like CNBC's American Greed. In Jerry's book, FBI Myths and Misconceptions, a manual for armchair detectives, she presents the top 20 cliches about the FBI in books, TVs, and movies. Her crime novels, Pay to Play and Greedy Givers, feature flawed female FBI agent Carrie Wheeler, Wheeler, a married mother of three investigating fraud and corruption in Philadelphia while struggling to balance her family responsibilities. I'll put links to all of this in my show notes. Jerry Williams received four U.S. Attorney Awards for Distinguished Service during her career, and in 2021, she was honored as the G-Man Honors Distinguished Service Honoree by the FBI Agents Association. This was a wide-ranging conversation covering some of Jerry's biggest cases and what to keep an eye out for as threats to America and American businesses, how to safeguard yourself in today's world, and also what motivates a criminal. So without further ado, here's Jerry Williams. Is going to require work and time and sweat and toil. If money wasn't an issue, what would I be doing? Don't worry about it. You'll figure it out. Change is the only constant. The Kadena Podcast. Jerry, welcome to the show. Thank you. I'm so happy and excited to be here. I love talking about uh, fraud and economic crime. Yeah, I know. It's one of those things that's certainly an unpleasant subject, but it can be exciting to talk about. (laughs) Yeah, it is. You know, when we talk about true crime, you know, a lot of people automatically think about murders and, and, and violent crime. But for me, I am even more so fascinated with financial crimes because I think they're even more devious and, 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 and intimate. I mean, you're usually having to have lots of contact with someone before you can defraud them. And that's just fascinating to me. Yeah, it really is. There's a lot that goes into it. And, uh, and maybe as a starting point, I know one of the biggest investigations you had in your career was a $350 million Ponzi scheme that you helped break up. Uh, that I believe was against nonprofit organizations. Can you maybe kind of walk us through that, perhaps as a case study to get started today on how something so gross actually gets started and then how it can grow to you know such magnitude? Yeah, so this particular Ponzi scheme, we found out, it, found out about it as the FBI from the newspaper of all things because nobody <laughs> who was involved or was a, a victim of this particular scheme, thought it was a, thought it was a fraud. Thought it was a Ponzi scheme. They believed that they were providing funding to the Foundation for New Era Philanthropy because there was an anonymous donor willing to match their charitable contributions. Now, when you talk about anonymous donor, it sounds kind of strange, but of course, matching funds for charities, corporations do that all the time. You know, they have a list of corporate of of charities and if their employees do want to contribute to those charities, the company will match it. It's just a way of encouraging people, uh, public service and and forgiving. And so Mm -hmm. John Bennett, who was the founder of the Foundation for New Era Philanthropy, uh, had this 
this charity where he said that he had anonymous donors who were willing to match contributions from philanthropists. And we're talking about if you give me $500,000 and I hold on to it for six months to, uh, to build up the uh, capital funding, I don't, I can't recall the exact excuse why he needed to hold on to the yep. uh, contributions, but if he held on to it for six months, then he would, the anonymous donor would match that and you would get a million dollars. And of course, for a Ponzi scheme, the reason they work is because the initial investors do get their investments back. They do make money, but they're not making money from the actual investment. They're making the money from new investors. So mm -hmm. the first people in get their money from the next people coming in. That's why it's called, you know, it's a, a Ponzi scheme and, and, it's a, and it's usually shaped with lots of people on the bottom and the people at the top do well. And so yeah. this is what happened in this situation. It didn't start out as a scam, as a scheme. And I think that's a lot of, a lot of times what people don't understand with Ponzi schemes. Most Ponzi schemes started out as a legitimate business or a legitimate investment that failed or that was failing. And instead of admitting this thing is not going well, the people that are involved who are hitting up the investment just try to keep more money coming in to, to, to try to rescue their business. And then it comes to a point where they have to keep it going because they can't admit that it's failing yeah. because you really don't make a lot of money from a Ponzi scheme. It's not like different other investment frauds because most of the money that you're taking in is paid out to other people because mm -hmm. that's the only way to keep it going. And you've got and, to have that social proof that the investment is working. And the only way you can do that is to show the people who have made money off of it. And of course, to get them to go out and help you recruit more people. Uh, and sure. so that's what the situation was for this Ponzi scheme. And it got to a point where they had unbelievable uh, investors and victims you know, big giant corporations and nonprofits. And they usually targeted a lot of Christian organizations. It was really fascinating. Mm. At the time, it was the largest uh, charitable Ponzi scheme in the world. Wow, that's that's incredible. And so something like that, I think when a lot of people hear Ponzi scheme, they do think of investing. And, and like Bernie Madoff is probably the prime example where they're investing and then they're hoping to get a great return. So in this case, it, it actually wasn't an investment. These were people or corporations that were making a donation to, to the foundation. Right. I mean, in a, in a sense, they were hoping to, uh, you know, to gain a profit so that mm -hmm. they could double their donation. But yeah, it was, it was definitely a situation where they were not looking to gain money for themselves. They were looking to gain money for a nonprofit. Say um, there was a, 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 a let, me, let me think of a situation, you know, maybe sure. a Christian school, a school mm -hmm. that your child was going to, and you normally would, you know, invest every year in, in, in that school. But in this situation, you were told, hey, if you invest, you know, and, and give it to the uh, New Era Foundation of Philanthropy, we'll give you double that. Well, what a good feeling that makes. You know, you really sure. feel, wow, if I do this, I'm able to contribute twice as much. And so the people were doing a good thing. They were looking to help, you know, that particular school in that situation. And gotcha. maybe if the school came in at the beginning, they actually got their money. Got it. Okay. So where did the, like the fraud actually occur? Was it that it just was not being matched? Well, it, yeah, there was no anonymous donor. Again, okay. there was no such thing as anonymous donors. Those matches were made by investors that came in afterwards. And so, okay. you know, okay, a Ponzi gotcha. scheme always fails. There is no Ponzi scheme that will be able to go on forever. That's what happened with Bernie, uh, with Bernie Madoff. At, sure. Eventually, a Ponzi scheme is going to fail because there's not enough investors and people that you can get that will keep a Ponzi scheme going forever. At some point, 
you're just not going to have enough people coming in at the bottom that are going yeah. to allow you to pay the people that are already in uh, the, the Ponzi scheme, and, and they eventually fail. Yeah. And that's kind of what always baffled me. I know you said, you know, it actually began as a legitimate mission. And it, it seems like they all kind of have that story. I don't know if it's always true or not, that it starts out as a real enterprise. And then it's they run into difficulties or tough times, and they look at the Ponzi scheme as um, a way out. But I wonder, because like you said, they're impossible. They always have an end. I don't know if there's ever been a study where these people said, oh, you know, let's kind of go down this dark path but we're only going to do it for a year. And then as soon as we can kind of get our feet back under us, we'll unwind it and we'll be done with the whole Ponzi scheme. I don't know if that's ever happened or if it just always is that snowball that just gets bigger and bigger. I don't think it can happen because unless you get funding from an, another source, that the funding is all coming from this Ponzi scheme, then once you stop, then you have no way to pay those people, the last people who came into the scheme. So it yeah. will always fail. You are all, it was like a uh, hamster running on that hamster wheel. You're always running and running and running and running, trying to get new investors in to keep it afloat. And at some yeah. point, whether the person gets sick or they just can't keep telling lies or they can't find more victims, at some point it falls apart and next thing you know, everything collapses. Now, of course, the people yeah. at the top, you know, they're, they're good, you know, cause mm -hmm. they got their money. Uh, they, they, they got a profit and that's where the concept of clawback comes in, where most time, most of the time judges, when this, when, when it finally gets to court, claws back that money. They ask those investors at the beginning who made a profit to return that fund, those funds in order to make the other people whole or partially whole. And, and that's what happened in uh, the Bernie Madoff situation. A lot sure. of people don't understand. Yeah. Most of the people got their money back, not their investments, but they were able to get enough money from, uh, from people clawing back from the people who really made substantial profits and from selling uh, the assets of Bernie Madoff to, if you gave, you know, a hundred thousand dollars you might have gotten a hundred thousand dollars back at the end now of course you thought you were going to get you know uh five hundred thousand because you had this investment going you don't get the money that you thought you were going to get back as a profit but in many situations they're able to at least get you the money that you invested in the first place yeah yeah, and, and create somehow sort of a happy ending for the victim, at least to some extent. I know sometimes some it can be, uh, you know, pennies on the dollar, but something's better than nothing. And so in, in this instance, this was called the New Era Foundation. Was that the name of it? Yeah, New Era Foundation for Philanthropy. Okay. And so was there like a tipping point? Like, I know you said that you first began to investigate it, I think, through a newspaper article or outreach. Um what was it? I guess where was that maybe that first alarm that it, working in the FBI you you spotted or somebody comes forward says something's fishy here like where does where do you start to see the first bit of smoke where then you kind of dive in? They filed for bankruptcy because okay. they oh, I had, guess that's it. <laughs> yeah, uh, so it was a civil matter at the time with and the SEC had come the uh, Securities Exchange Commission had come after them because they started to look at this as, is this a financial investment instead of a charity? And they had not filed the, paper, the correct paperwork to be an investment, so the SEC was looking at them. They had also, uh, John Bennett, the, the, the founder, had also um, taken out a loan with Prudential Securities to get some, because again, he, he was trying and trying to get more victims and it was a point where he needed, he needed more money. And so he took out a loan. And mm -hmm. when he wasn't uh, paying on that loan, they did a margin call. And that's when they had to file for bankruptcy. And at that point, when the SEC was looking at them and Prudential was looking at their financials, they said, wait a minute, something strange is going on here. We don't see any money coming in from this anonymous, these anonymous donors, this is, this looks like it's a Ponzi scheme. 
And so all of that stuff was going on before the FBI came in. But again, one morning I'm, I'm reading the newspaper, the Philadelphia Inquirer, and the headlines, front page headlines is, you know, that this organization has filed for bankruptcy. And one of the points is, could this be a Ponzi scheme? I went right into my supervisor's office and I said, did you see this? I'd love to look into this further and went over to yep. the United States attorney's office to, to discuss it. And, uh, we opened wow. a case. It was myself and, and two other agents, uh, Brian Cosgrove and Loretta, Loretta Hart that worked with two prosecutors and a slew of, uh, forensic accountants and, and, and other support people who worked on this case in order to figure out what was going on. And so who did you charge in that? I mean, like when you think of these things and you hear a number like 350 million, I know in some circles that may not be so much in others, it's a, just an enormous figure. Um, were there a, a number of people that, that were in the know that you charged or was it something that like the only the, the gentleman, John Bennett at the top really knew kind of what was going on under the hood? Like, what did that look like? Yeah, so first of all, I need to make sure everyone understands it was a $350 million Ponzi scheme. But again, after clawback and after asset, uh, you know, uh, forfeitures and things like that, the actual loss came down to about $150 million, which is still substantial. Sure. You know, so yeah. the, the, the final loss uh, was about 150 But um, it was John Bennett who was given 12 years. He, he was sent to prison for 12 years. And also his accountant, who, uh, because of John Bennett giving him bribes and money, uh, he kind of looked the other way. Uh, he mm -hmm. may not have known everything that was going on, but he uh, did not do his, du his duties, his uh, fiduciary duties. And therefore, he also received some prison time. And you know what? I can't recall what he got exactly but uh definitely john bennett got 12 years and there really was no one else because he really did a good job of keeping the anonymous donor part to himself he handled that and mm -hmm. um you know with the manipulation of the finances most of the people who worked for him had no idea that it was all just one big fat lie Wow. And one of the things I always ask about this, especially with like Bernie Madoff as, as another example, there were a number of people, a number of even his early investors that, that went on record and said something did not seem right. Yeah. You know, and when I dug deeper, when I asked the question, I never got a straight answer. And it's like all the flags went up where it said, you know, this is not legit. But they kind of turned a blind eye and said, well, I keep getting my dividend every year. It's pretty darn nice. And they said, let's just roll with this. Are they ever, and this is a bit of a legal question, but can they ever be in a position where they could be facing um, some sort of civil or criminal penalty for kind of knowing, but saying, well, I didn't really know. So I just kept on going along with it. You know, I feel like there's such a gray area there where, um, you know, that's how these things can just go on for so long. Yeah, but that's the whole concept of fraud. You know, the whole concept of fraud is being convinced by someone, whether it be someone like John Bennett or, or um, Bernie Madoff or a salesperson or a relative, a con man, to give you something of value. It's not stolen from you. You're giving them something of value based on a lie or deception. And if the person is really, really good at lying and deceiving and tricking you and telling you the things that you want to hear, then, you know, you're a victim. And there was a time when I did, I think I did a lot of victim blaming, thinking like, you know, this person just obviously was stupid. You know, they weren't <laughs> paying attention. But then when you start looking into the scheme and how many people were uh, duped, you get a better understanding of, of how that happened. And most of the time, the reason it happened is because you look around you and you see people who have been successful in, you know, this particular scheme. They've made money. That's your mm -hmm. social proof. 
and you don't take the next step of doing your own due diligence. You just depend on that. But that concept in itself is, is understandable. Yeah. You know, I don't and- want to miss out on this opportunity. My next door neighbor or the person I go to church with or, you know, a coworker has been making money. It's true. They've gotten, you know, they've made well on this investment. And I don't want to lose out on that opportunity. And so you, you, you get to understand after working with so many victims of these financial crimes, you get to understand what happened and you, you understand that, that there, you, there in the back, there may be some responsibility because you got duped, but I don't know if that's really fair for us to, to yeah, true. look at it that way. Yeah, because I mean, as I'm hearing all this and thinking about it, like I imagine as a fraudster, it's like you have almost two kind of clients. You have the victims that you completely dupe that until you kind of pull back the curtain, they're like, oh, my gosh, I had no idea. And then you have the victims that are getting duped, but they're saying, like, it's OK. I, you know, I'm, I'm, it's working out. So, uh, yeah, it, it seems wrong or fishy, but. I'll just keep going with it. And I feel like as a fraudster, those are like the ideal ones where you build almost a community of yeah. people that are like, yeah, we're, we're not supporting you, but by being here, we'll continue to support you. Right. And that's the whole goal of a con man or a con artist or a fraudster is to find those people that are gullible, that are vulnerable and, and, and take advantage of it. I mean, that's yeah. what you're looking for as a, as a fraudster. You're looking for that type of person who, you know, doesn't feel like doing their own, you know, due diligence or research. And they yeah. just look around and said, hey, he's making money. I want to get in on that. Yeah. And it, but it's just especially terrible to see it in an instance like this where it's with a nonprofit and, yes. um, you know, these Christian organizations and definitely people trying to do well, but uh, that run into that. And so I know in your career, you spent a lot of time, you know, chasing Ponzi schemes like this. Uh, but you also mentioned what are called advanced fee scams, uh, embezzlement, and then also business to business telemarketing fraud. Exactly. Um, which I wasn't too familiar with. Can you just tell tell our listeners like what are some of those uh, scams? Like how how do those ones work? Okay. Yeah. So I only had the one Ponzi scheme. It was a huge case, but I only had the one Ponzi scheme. I spent most of yep. my time on advanced fee schemes and uh, embezzlements and the business to business telemarketing. The business to business telemarketing is the same thing. There's people in a as as the regular telemarketing, but there's people in uh, a boiler room, you know, they're just sitting there on the phone and they're calling businesses trying to get them to purchase products. Most of the time, these products are inflated, you know, so they're providing, they're, they're overbilling them for product. And the way they do that is that they get uh, friendly with the procurement officer for that business. And they may send them bribes. I, there were many companies in Philadelphia that I, uh, we did like a, a, a group two operation. We call it an undercover operation where we had plenty of uh, companies all over the country because these are calls. So we can call people. They were calling people all over the country, getting them to buy cleaning supplies and light bulbs and things like that, but overbilling them for just ridiculous amounts of money. But they were able to get away with it because they got friendly with the procurement officers and were sending them uh, gift certificates for things like lawnmowers and wash machines and televisions. And they would they knew that they had what they called a taker. That's what they used to, to call these procurement officers who were going to go when um go with the scheme they called them takers because if you could get them to take this this gift certificate by giving you their home address i'll mail it to you let me make sure let me mail it to your home address so that it doesn't get lost well we know at that point if they agreed to let the person that's calling them the fraudster call them uh, who's calling them send it to their home address that they're willing to take a bribe they're not going to tell their employers that they approve this invoice because they got a wash machine or a lawnmower or a TV. Huh. And when they would continue with this, 
you know, when, when it became this really uh, close relationship, it got to a point where they couldn't take any more product. You know, I bought so much from you. I've got a storage room full of your stuff. And so in some situations, they would just send the invoice, get the invoice approved and never ship any product. And so this was a multi-million dollar scheme that and several companies at the time when um, I investigated my largest one, we went after 14 different companies in the Philadelphia area that were making these calls and overbilling and sending out false invoices to these other companies, whether they were schools or small businesses around the country. Uh, but it was a really interesting case. I, I had like 25 people that ended up being uh, convicted and uh, you know sent off to sent off to prison for for different uh, time periods based on uh, this particular scheme that they were involved in. Jeez, that's crazy. It's um, and if I can kind of give a little uh, you know personal story here, I remember when I was in college on a winter break. I had a friend of mine that actually worked at a telemarketing uh, agency. And he was like, hey, it's it's easy money. You just come in. We have like these five-hour shifts. You put on your headset. You just kind of hang out and, and just call all of these people on this list. And, um, you know, just help me out, you know, do it for like a month. I remember I did that. And what we were doing is we were raising funds for the Fraternal Order of Police, or the FOP. And so we would, the computer would just dial the number. We'd call it and say, hey, we're calling to get a donation to help out, you know, victims of, of fallen police officers and their families and so forth. And then we could get $10, $20, maybe $50 in a donation. And I never knew this is just like, a, I was 19 years old, I think. You're calling and you don't know how much of that donation actually goes to the end charity. Very small percent. Percentage. Yeah. And nor does the person that you're calling and they're like, okay, cool. I make my donation. I get your sticker that I could put on my car that, that I support the police and stuff. And eventually that organization I heard way later on that, uh, that we were calling for ended up getting busted. Um, and they broke it up and it was because of that, I guess they hadn't been disclosing it. And so they didn't get put away. They just reopened under a different name and continued working with the same organization. But there was a disclaimer. My buddy told me that once you read the script at the end, you had to say at least 1% of your donation will go to the FOP or the different charity, which I was like, you got to be kidding. Like, how would people know that and continue to donate? Yeah, yeah. But I was that was my first like exposure to like, wow, these are just pure scams that are out there. And what really scared me is I was like, the charity, if they're they're paying a fee, but if they're making a profit on that, um, and saying, hey, at least we're getting some donations. It was better than nothing before from the, that crowd of customers. Um, what's almost to stop that charity from saying, we're just, that's money out there that we can get. Why not go get it? Yeah, that that's true. And I, I think even for that particular, those particular companies, say if it was the FOP, the Fraternal Order of Police, they may not have been aware Maybe they they were guaranteed we're going to get you ten thousand a month. Well, they're not aware that they're actually making a hundred thousand a month. Correct. You know, yeah. so uh, yeah. they were even duped in in, in that sense too, uh, because again, not asking the, the the full question about exactly what percentage of the money that you're taking in is coming to me, and and what percentage are you getting? You know, your overhead cost, et cetera. Um, you yeah. Know, what 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 are you getting from this? Um, but yeah, yeah that, that, that's an example of, you know, telemarketing. Of course, they're telemarketing individuals. When you look at telemarketing, that's business to business. You can see how much more money is coming in and how much more money uh, can be uh, can be taken based on lies and deceptions yeah. that are told to the procurement officer and then the procurement officer to his own company. Yeah, and it seems like now the um at least from what I hear anecdotally that the most popular crimes in this kind of realm seem to be more online and uh especially through email and stuff like that. I mean, it, can you tell us a little of of your experience if you had any with kind of what was going on and emails and and all and ransomware and all these different things that people are getting kind of lured into and how how do we prevent that? I mean, sometimes it seems so easy just to be like, oh, don't click that link from 
the guy in Nigeria is going to make you a prince and give you $10,000. But it seems like this stuff continues to happen every day. Yeah. Now, I was in the FBI many, many years ago, but I tried to stay relevant, you know, through my interviews on my podcast and, of course, just reading uh, news articles about current cases. But the, the best thing that people can do is when they get an email or they get some type of solicitation to look at the URL. Who is it really from? I mean, I'm sure you, you know, just like me, constantly get emails from people. Oh, let's check on your, your bank account. You know, click this link. We need to verify or update your verification. And if you look at the URL, you'll easily see this is not from PNC Bank or, or you know, any of the other banks. This, this, this is from, you know, some random, per, random person. And so the best way is if you ever get any type of email, any type of solicitation, don't click on that. Go directly to your bank or, you know, gas company or telephone company, whoever the email came from, go directly into your account on that site and see if there is any type of, you know, survey or update request. Never, ever click on the link that you receive directly in your email. And that's the best way for you to avoid being scammed. Got it. No, well said. And it kind of piggybacking on that, I guess the other question I have, again, kind of staying relevant here is, you may or may not know this, but like with the Bitcoin and, and cryptocurrency and things, it seems like a lot of these scammers now, especially the ones online, when they are successful, they then want their payment in cryptocurrency. Um, is that is, and I don't, again, I don't know if this is your wheelhouse, but is cryptocurrency helping the good guys or is it helping the bad guys? I don't, I, I purposely don't know anything about cryptocurrency. I, okay. I have only heard negative things about it. Uh, the advantage that they say about cryptocurrency is that it's not regulated to me. That's the disadvantage of cryptocurrency sure. and so i i just hear too many bad guys taking advantage of cryptocurrency situations and i maybe i'm missing out i don't know <laughs> maybe maybe it will come through but i mean over and over and over again you hear about people who have been taken advantage sure. and defrauded and i am just i'm not, you know i'm i'm not <laughs> I'm not interested. Uh, yeah, I certainly I, I think wouldn't recommend anybody uh, to 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 do it. Are are you into cryptocurrency? I am not. No, I mean as a financial advisor, I'm I'm constantly asked about it. Um, I do full disclosure. I do own some Bitcoin, um, but I, I wouldn't say that I'm a proponent. I mean, it's a tiny sliver of my portfolio. Uh, and in clients, I always tell them, I'm like, hey, you know, yeah, maybe there is that huge upside potential. Everyone wants to compare it to the internet. That at the beginning, people were like, oh, the internet, that sounds ludicrous. And now here it is. And they say, hey, could Bitcoin be like that or crypto? Um, and I, I don't want to, I'm not, I'm not that big of a proponent or that knowledgeable on it to pass judgment, I would say. But what I do tell them is it's extremely speculative. Mm -hmm. um, so just recognize that, you know, if you want to take that risk, go ahead. But I mean, it bounces all over the map from an investment standpoint. And then there's all these unknowns of the regulation as well. Uh, so I was just kind of curious on that. I think it's something we're kind of learning on the go. Um, but yeah, I know that there's definitely a connectivity between that and then the evildoers that are out there. Mm. And, and I wanted to kind of maybe segue into another question that may be more prevalent now, but I imagine you ran into this, is when you're investigating something as the FBI, and then it quickly turns out to, hey, this is a scam or operating over in Russia or wherever it is that we see it, and it's not here in the States, what happens then? Do you, do you hand the investigation off to someone else, or do you continue to pursue that even as it goes abroad? Yeah, if there are victims in the United States, and we continue uh, even working on it, even though it's international, we have really good relationships with our international security and law enforcement partners. And we, you know, there are agents that are assigned at and working in uh, outside of FBI or inside of U.S. embassies 
as legal attaches or legats and alats, assistant legal attaches, all over the world. And although we can't actually do investigations in those countries, we team up with security and law enforcement in those countries and work hmm. with them side by side in order to complete our investigation. Say somebody needs to be interviewed, then we would either go with one of those foreign law enforcement agencies to do interviews, or we would have them do them on our behalf. The same thing, if there are subpoena records that we need, we would work with those agencies, foreign agencies, to help us gather that information. And, the, and vice versa, if they have somebody operating in the U.S., that is victimizing people in their company and in their country, then we work with them very well too. Uh, I don't know the status sure. of the FBI's office in Moscow. Um, I just did a, I just did a podcast interview last week uh, that I posted. That's really fascinating. Uh, but it took place. This particular case took place when the Soviet Union collapsed and everybody was going in and looting from the government. But it was fascinating. But it talks about the agents working in Moscow to, in order to help the Russian government get back their, their assets that had been looted. So, yeah, those relationships are, are definitely uh, international, and we do uh, work internationally to complete our investigations. That's that's so interesting to kind of see that dynamic there. And did you? I just had a curiosity. Did you have like any countries where, when you found out oh, the the perpetrator is in Italy or Britain or Russia or whatever it was, where you there were ones that you liked working with, where you were like, yes, we're definitely getting to the bottom of this, versus others you're like, ah, oh, it's a lost cause. <laughs> I I had one particular case that you know was I was able to uh, travel to uh, Madrid. Uh, to do uh, an interview, a, a deposition, uh, at, which was pretty exciting. The, the, the person that we were interviewing and talking to was a financier who lived in France. But France has very, very strict laws about cooperation with law enforcement and interviewing and de uh, uh, depositions. And so we actually had the person travel from France to Spain in order to hmm. conduct a uh, conduct our interview. But uh, yeah, those type of cases, I had a case also in China that I never completed because it became too difficult. But it was a, a Chinese American who had invested in a company in China that, that um, what's the way I want to say this? They, uh, they took metals and they separated metals. It, was, it, it had to do with recycling and, and metal recycling. And uh, he had made this investment, and he believed he was defrauded. Well, it was a lot of money, but it was very, very difficult for us to get the information that we needed from China. And so eventually, even though you know I had agents uh, in, in, who were assigned to China trying to help me gather the information, it got to a point where we, I realized that I was not going to be able to uh, work that case, and I had to let the victim know that we were not going to be able to go further on the investigation oh man yeah and i'm sure that's tough news to hear but i guess i guess those are the risks you take you know when you kind of do business with some of these foreign places so i know we're, we're covering a lot of kind of the, the scope of scamming and everything but it just so our, our guests can understand a little bit more about you and the fbi can you tell us how did you actually get started with the fbi I was a juvenile probation officer in lovely <laughs> Newport News, Virginia. I had been a, a psychology major in college, and um, so I was actually using my psychology skills as a probation officer. My title was really aftercare counselor. I got all the kids that went away to reform schools and group homes and placement centers, and I worked with them trying to uh, integrate them back into the community after they had served their time. So they had already been adjudicated and had been sent away, and now they're coming back to the community. And so I work with them. And it was a great job, but it was emotionally draining because yeah. you had these kids, you know, that were fun and energetic, but, you know, they were committing crimes, you know, serious crimes. 
whether they be burglaries or assaults or some of the girls back then we called it prostitution but we know that they were sexually you know sexual traffic um was sexual trafficking that they were involved in because they were they were underage uh kids that were addicted to drugs and and, and making home invasions things like that uh, and these were the kids that I had on my caseload and I was so young I was uh, I started that job when I was 22 right out, right out of college 22 23 24 I I worked it for over three years. And so when I saw a, a, my, my daughter's calling me, let me just <laughs> click this off. So that <laughs> That's fine. She knows I can't talk to her. Um, <laughs> so when I saw that there was an ad in a newsletter that said that the FBI was looking for women and minorities, this is back in 1982. So we're talking 42 years ago. Um, it was at a time when there mm. were not a lot of women in the FBI. Women had been allowed to join the FBI in 1972, but by 1982, there still was only a, a few hundred, uh, as opposed to the you know several thousand agents. And so they were looking to get more women. They were looking to get more minorities. And I mm -hmm. looked at myself and I thought, click, click, check, check, you know. <laughs> and so uh, you know, I made that call. And when I called, the agent recruiter really recruited <laughs> me. He wanted me to be in the FBI. And so I, you know, I decided, let's give this a try. And six months later, I was walking into the FBI Academy. Wow, that yeah. is so cool. And did you know when you when you said, that, all right, this is kind of piquing my interest, that you wanted to get into like economic investigations? How did that come about? No, I I did not. I don't know what I wanted to do. There were just so, I mean, the, the number of violations that the FBI investigates is amazing. And we're talking about 300 or so different violations that the FBI investigates. And so I had no idea what I wanted to do. And a lot of times when you join the FBI as a new agent, you don't really have a choice anyway. <laughs> you know, I didn't have a choice as to where I was assigned. I didn't have a choice as to the type of cases that I worked. So I came in uh, after the uh, FBI Academy, they sent me back to Virginia, Norfolk, Virginia, uh, for six months. And then I was sent to Sacramento, California. You can't get much further away from home than that. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> no choice in that matter. They just said, go to Sacramento. I went to Sacramento. And then uh, once I was there, I was assigned to government fraud, uh, which I did not like. Hmm. I didn't like government fraud be as much because the victim is the government. And so there wasn't that, that connection. When you did your interviews, you were talking to government employees and they were, um, you know, that they, they were passionate about the loss, but it wasn't the same as having an individual victim that was defrauded. So I, I worked government fraud. I learned a lot. But then when I got to Philadelphia, I was able to... Uh, get on, go, go from government fraud to an economic crime where you actually have individual victims, which I found really compelling and really interesting. And it just became something I decided to uh, specialize in, you know, because at some point I could have gone to another squad, I could have worked something else, but I really enjoyed working economic crime and fraud investigation, so I stuck to it. I would have liked to have done public corruption, and I did try to, to make that switch, but it, did, it didn't happen. But I ended up uh, specializing my entire career in uh, public um, in economic crime. Got it. That's, that's such an interesting journey. And when we were discussing just a moment ago, like these different cases and scams that you pursue, it seems like it would really be conducive to like a major in accounting or mathematics or forensic accounting. Uh, is, is that the case where like they want those or is the FBI open to psychology majors and other people that then they can mold into what they want? Because it seems like at the end of the day, like really the the smoke that you're finding where the fire's coming from always seems to be numbers and, and Absolutely. You know, numbers that don't match up. <laughs> yeah. And definitely there are many, many agents who come into the FBI with accounting background. I mean, years ago, I'm talking about in the early, you know, 1940s or something, uh, they only hired FBI agents who had accounting or law degrees. So that was a long really? time ago. 
but definitely yeah. those working in the white collar crime field, there are there are a large majority that are accountants who, who are CPAs who are doing this type of work. And, and even on the Ponzi scheme case that I talked about, you know, Brian Cosgrove, one of the agents who worked on the case, was a CPA, and he was responsible for a lot of those financial uh, evaluations. We also have non-agent support personnel, professional support personnel, who are forensic accountants. And so, you know, even as an investigator, who or I'm, my skill is in, you know, interviewing and surveillance and, you know, un running undercovers and, and, and things like that, I can get this forensic accountant, non-agent, to work with me on the case to help me with the numbers stuff, you know. Sure. Uh, so, uh, sure. but definitely, we are looking for accountants in the, in the FBI uh, to to serve both as special agents and as professional support people. It's it's very important for us to to have that skill set. Yeah, I would imagine so. And and that kind of leads me to another question: is like over your tenure with the FBI. Did you find that there was a certain trait or, or commonality amongst criminals? Was it always they just wanted more and more money, or were there other motives that that you kind of noticed? Okay, you know something's awry here. Well, have you heard of the fraud triangle? I have not. No. Okay, so the fraud triangle is when uh, you're investigating fraud, and the person who is responsible for that fraud it's kind of a way of looking at their motivation and why they do, they're doing what they're doing. And there's three aspects, of course, it's the triangle. And the yeah. first aspect of that triangle, uh, whether or not someone's going to commit a fraud, is opportunity. Do they have the opportunity? Are they in a place or a situation where the accounting principles are not strong and that they have access to uh, finances? Uh, are they in a situation where they, uh, you know, they're around people that are vulnerable and desperate that they can, you know, scheme and, and deceive? So the first part, again, is opportunity. Um, and this happens a lot, a, a lot too, with advance fees and embezzlements. This is the second part is pressure. You know, do you feel the pressure of uh, needing money? You know, whether it's greed or you're depressed and just want to make yourself feel better, so you want more money, if you have an addiction, gambling, drugs, um, you know, just that type of pressure. So opportunity, pressure. And the other part of being a fraudster and committing a fraud is rationaliz rationalization. Can you be able to convince yourself that what you're doing, you know, deceiving somebody and taking their money is a good thing? Well, it's a good hmm. thing because they're stupid enough, you know, they're, you know, I, they should have looked and checked that I'm going to rationalize this or, you know, I'm stealing from my boss because, you know, he's mean to me and he won't let me do what he's going to do. Or I'm stealing from my corporation because I just need a little bit of money. And as soon as I get back on my feet, I'm going to give it back. I'm going to um, slip the money back. So again, opportunity, pressure and rationalization. And so when you talk about you know who is committing a fraud who is the con person those are the type of concepts that uh, that we look at that's really interesting and th so the third point of that triangle of rationalizing something i was surprised to hear that cuz i think a lot of people think okay they're a criminal they're evil they don't have rationale they they just say i want this because of this and then they do it and they don't think of do i need to kind of you know, morally accept this and come to peace with it, that that doesn't exist within them. Do you find that, that, that lots of times these criminals are people that have just natural good intent, but then they, they lie to themselves to accept their wrongdoing? Yeah. And if you think about it, because fraud is, fraud is kind of different. And that's why I find it so fascinating, because when you talk about a criminal, you, you, you're, you kind of think of this evil person. But let's just say you have a situation where your grandmother, you know, you have a grandmother that has lots of money and the grandchild really wants to start a business or they want to buy something or go someplace. And they talk the grandmother into letting them help them with their finances. And in the meantime, they're draining their grandmother's bank account. You know, 
are they evil? That sounds evil to me, but it also just, it, it just sounds like somebody who is desperate, who rationalizes that when my grandmother dies, I'm going to inherit all of this anyway. So why not take advantage of it now? So that's what I'm talking about, the, the types of things that are, are also rationalizing. Is that person a criminal? Absolutely. You know, they deceived their grandparent and took something of value based on a lie or deception. Grandma, I'm helping you out, when instead they were just taking advantage of it. Uh, but are they evil? You know, it depends, you know. Is, is grandma now eating do dog and cat food because, you know, you've, you've drained her bank account and she can't afford, you know, to, to you know, proper uh, nutrition and health care? Yeah, now you're evil. So it, yeah. there, there are different levels and, you know, grading of, uh, of, of that title. Or that that's, definition. Yeah, that, that's very interesting to kind of look at it that way. And I wanted to ask you on the kind of the first two legs of that stool or, or parts of that triangle, opportunity and pressure. Um, I remember I had, I think, one criminology class. I was a finance and economics major, but I had one criminology class in college. And I remember there was a study on the chances that I would get caught doing a crime versus the severity of the punishment. And so they kind of looked at like, if I, you know, committed this crime and there was a 90% chance that I would get caught, but the punishment was I was going to do two weeks in prison, or if I committed the crime, but there was only a 1% chance I'd get caught, but I could go away for life, that people would be more compliant with the severe punishment. In your like experience, do you have any take on that, that you would like to see stiffer punishment? Or you would like to see more just general punishment? Like, what's some of your thoughts on that? My thought is, and this will be kind of controversial, is that deterrent, you know, is really not something that a criminal, no matter what type of crime they're committing, is really thinking about when they commit their crime. You know, there is some other reason that's so much stronger that they're doing this crime that they're not thinking about. Will I get caught? You know, what's going to so happen? They don't look at the risk caught? reward of that. Yeah. They're just thinking about at that moment, whether it's violent crime or public corruption or, you know, financial crime or, you know, a uh, uh, predator, you know, uh, you know, a sexual predator. They're not thinking at, about whether or not they're going to be caught or not. If they did, who would commit a crime? You know, they're just thinking about their particular wants and needs, the pressure, the rationalization, the opportunity at that time, and whether or not they're going to be caught is something that they think about usually after they've committed the crime. That's, yeah, that is very interesting. I wouldn't expect that, but um, I mean, you know more about this than I do for sure. <laughs> yeah, but nobody is thinking in most situations, I mean, I, I think it's very necessary that we have prisons, that we have jails and that people have to suffer the consequences of their crime. But I don't think most criminals are thinking about that hmm. when they commit the crime. It, it, the reason I brought that up is like you had mentioned, I think that in the huge $350 million Ponzi scheme that you busted, the leader of it, what did you say he got like 12, 12 years? Yeah, 12 years. Yeah, and I His think when the- exposure was 24. He could have gotten up to 24 to 25 years the judge gave him 12. Huh. And I think when people hear that, that's what really ticks off like the general public, especially in an instance like that, where you're taking advantage of people who are trying to do good through charity. Uh, and you, that just gigantic sum of money that that is being frankly stolen. And even like, um, I'm drawing a blank on his name, but the Wolf of Wall Street guy that they uh, made the whole Jordan Belfort. Yes, yes. <laughs> so you see him now he's I mean, you would think this guy's a celebrity. Yeah. And everyone forgets what he did, what made him famous, these just gross crimes that he committed. And I think that's what, I guess that's the American way is you get that second chance. But I think sometimes it's hard to stomach, especially when you see it in the white collar world that, you know, you can ruin who knows how many people's lives and their oh, financial absolutely. well being. And then it's like, well, you didn't kill someone or beat someone up. So. We'll see you there in four is, years. I don't think there's, there's, I think that 
there is what I would call economic violence when you still some elderly couple couples like when you still some elderly couples life savings. That's economic violence. You know, there's sure. nothing that they could do to get that money back and their future has definitely been altered. And you're right. Um, you know, how do we compare that to someone that has killed someone? It that person is gone forever. You know, their life has been stolen. Uh so you know, you can, you can understand the difference in the consequences, but I would say that the results can still be devastating to the victim. Sure. Yeah, definitely. It's, it could be even more so in some instances. I think I'd rather get punched in the face than have somebody take all my money. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's you, like, I don't know if you saw my, not... on the homepage of my website, I have a quote that I've been perfecting for a few years, and it is, with a gun, they can steal hundreds. With a lie, they can steal millions. Yeah, that's I like that. Yeah, yeah. that's and it's so true too. Mm -hmm. And so, just to pivot for a minute here, Jerry, I know you you're out there in the public, and you've been pretty um, you know outspoken that you don't want to be outspoken about politics. Yes. Is in I feel like politics is just dominating every aspect of media, economics, you know, public policy, schooling. It everywhere is politics and it usually does seem negative right now. I, I think anybody could observe that. Why do you, with your experience, why do you want to try and stay out of the political realm? Uh, because as an FBI agent and as current FBI agents, uh are also involved in, we stay out of politics. We don't care, you know, the political uh, affiliation of our victims, our subjects are the case. You know, we're, uh, we are looking at facts. We are looking at, you know, investigating what is happening. I don't ever recall during my FBI career talking about politics. You know, that was my own personal, of course, I, I have political views, but that was mm -hmm. my own personal uh, viewpoints that I, you know, discussed when I got home with my friends, but I never discussed it at work. And I truly believe that that is uh, the most important thing for all law enforcement, for all intelligence, for all government uh, entities, is that they stay mm -hmm. out of politics. And I know there are going to be people who are going to probably comment on this saying, oh, the, the FBI is political, but the FBI is not political. You know, they're, we're working, like I said, hundreds of violations and ha that have nothing to do with politics. Now, we have had cases that have been very uh, upfront and out there in, the, um, in current events that involve political figures. And that, of course, is always um, puts any government agency in, in the targets and, and the viewpoints of other people questioning viewpoints and 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 the work that is be, that's being done but i truly um believe that in most situations and i'm not saying that you know we're definitely per perfect and that fbi agents are perfect and that we haven't had any instances where that has happened but for the for the majority of investigations they are nonpartisan and apolitical and we just make sure that we are doing everything that we can to keep Americans safe. That's the bottom line. And I truly believe that the current director, who I've had a chance to interview on my podcast, my 300th episode, uh, you know, I, I truly believe that that is his viewpoint, too, to for FBI employees to keep their head down and do the work and not let all of this uh, this political commentary and nastiness and 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 divisiveness affect their work yeah and i i hope you're right about that and i think by and large i'm sure that you are it's just some of the um i guess the tone that i've felt and also i've heard from other folks is that 99 percent of these organizations a lot of the government organizations are doing the right thing but at the top at that upper level that's where there can be a tendency to get politicized. 
And, and I think that obviously that's what we're seeing in the news all the time. And, and it would be a shame to see that kind of happen. But it's so hard when you see these huge public figures all the way up to the president and presidential candidates that find themselves in some way, shape or form another investigation. And then it's like, well, if the FBI or whoever, you know, does a good job, they're going to be guilty. Or if they do a bad job, they'll get away. And it's, it, and, I don't know, and, it's such a tricky thing to solve, you know? And, and Yes. And I will say that I myself am disappointed in some former uh, FBI employees, uh, even people that I know, people I've interviewed on my podcast, who make comments that they're about issues that they really have no idea what the truth is. You know, they're mm -hmm. not in the FBI. They they haven't had the opportunity to look at the facts, to to review the um, evaluations or the investigations, but they're making comments. Um, and so that's why I have dedicated my mission to not comment on political things, on partisan things, uh, and even current events, because uh, I don't know. I don't know what's going on. And to yeah. make that speculation as an FBI agent, especially in my position, you know, I am, I guess, technically an influencer when it comes to, you know, the FBI, uh, because people, you know, follow the podcast. And I don't need to be using my platform to put out my thoughts, my opinions, my political uh, commentary. I just want to show people who the FBI is and what the FBI does by presenting my work and letting them, letting those stories, letting those case reviews speak for themselves. And so I allow my people who follow me um, uh, my listeners to make their own decisions about the FBI. And I've got some fascinating stories and case reviews to tell them that will make them as proud of the FBI as I am. I bet. Yeah. And I give you a lot of credit for that because I know everybody has opinions and your opinion in this space certainly would carry more weight than most. So I'm sure a lot of people want to hear it. And I bet it sometimes it could be tempting to chime in on these different subjects. Um, so that's, uh, I give you a lot of credit for sometimes saying it's that's... hard sometimes. I will say that it, is, <laughs> I couldn't it imagine. is difficult sometimes, but I accept yeah. the responsibility. And I think that is why, um, you know, the FBI agents association, when I got the award from them, this, the FBI agents association is the, uh, it's like the union, you know, the uh, okay. active agents. So the agents who are in the FBI now voted for me you know, to receive the Distinguished Service Award. And I think one of the reasons they did it is because they know that I am committed to being, uh, you know, non you know, a, 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 you know, nonpartisan and, and sure. stay out of politics. And I think that's the reason that, you know, FBI Director Christopher Ray agreed to be a guest on the podcast, because I've proven that I'm going to stay out of that. You know, yeah. I'm going to stay out of that. I'm just going to showcase the stories of the FBI and, again, make the public, uh, allow the public to make their own opinion about the work that's being done. Yeah, no, that's great. And I know that that takes a lot of humility. Um, and I think that's a lot of the problem out there is, especially with social media today, mm -hmm. is everybody is an expert. And, and it is extremely frustrating to see, you know, you might have read the first two sentences of a six page article, and now you're telling the world what's right and wrong. And it's like, no one wants to take a bit of a deeper dive. And it's, uh, it is very frustrating. So I'm sure you could see that as well. Yeah. And the other reason I feel so committed to taking this stand, <laughs> non stand. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That, yeah. yeah, is that there are people working in the FBI, there's about, there's about I think it's a total of 64,000 people working for the FBI, about 14,000 of them, you know, are agents. I think I've got that number right. Is it 38,000 38, and 14,000 agents? I'm sorry, I, I, don't, I don't have the total number, but they're working now. And for mm -hmm. their, to, I, I want to make sure that I am, am lifting them, encouraging them, supporting them, 
Uh, and you know, when we see these books about you know the FBI is failing or people talking about you know the FBI is political, I'm thinking about all these employees are who are doing this great work. Uh, hopefully, they're doing what I did when I was in my career. Again, just keeping my head down and not paying any attention to that. But I just want to make sure that there is a place where the public and FBI employees, I have a lot of people who listen, who uh, actually are, are current employees, that they have a place where they can go, where they can see that they're supported and their work is appreciated. No, that's fantastic. That's great to hear. And so if we kind of, as we wrap up some of this conversation, I know we're covering a lot of different ground here. So if we even go a little bit higher, kind of the 10,000 foot view, if you look at what's going on here and abroad, what would you say are some of the biggest threats in your opinion, just not that we'll hold it to you, in your opinion, what are some of the biggest threats facing Americans today and, and business owners today? Oh, definitely. You know, economically is the uh, the um, the intelligence, the stealing of uh, of American intelligence and, and technology. I mean, that's the biggest thing. And of course, you know, we're, it's China and Russia, and of course, also their involvement in our political system. So those are the biggest things. I didn't work that type of investigation uh, when I was in the FBI, but I do know it's definitely you know, and, and counterintelligence and intelligence are definitely one of the biggest things when uh, in the FBI today, because we're trying to safeguard, you know, our our infrastructure and mm -hmm. not allow uh, these different foreign countries to, to, to steal all the hard work, research and investments that our American companies have been have been making in this effort. And so along those lines, I mean, I, I love the triangle you brought up. When you're dealing with those things that are on a grander scale, we're talking about China or Russia and protecting all of our knowledge and technology here in the States. Do you look at that triangle again and say, okay, what are the opportunities China or Russia sees by stealing this? What are, you know, the pressures that they're under maybe to keep up, you know, competitively from an economic standpoint? And then are they sitting there, is Xi Jinping and Putin sitting there rationalizing? Right, yeah. You know, yeah. That, I'm hey, sure I'm the in the right. I'm not doing anything is, wrong. Yeah, I'm sure the rational, their rationalization is is that they're doing this for the good of their own country. And so it's mm -hmm. okay to steal from us if it's going to help, you know, Russia or, or China. So, yeah, you know, I never thought of that way. Uh, thought of it that it way. It's the same yeah. motives. Yeah, it's yeah. the same motives. You know, I guess whenever you do something, that is questionable, criminal, uh, with criminal potential. You know, you use those 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 same uh, broad concepts, those frank, those same uh, and, triangles. Yeah, and I, I guess it kind of applies both to the macro and the micro. Like, if you look at those three things that we want to try and, um, I guess I don't know the right word, like focus on, but also be able to defend ourselves. Is, do we want to take a stance as as Americans of let's prevent those opportunities from existing either by having better cybersecurity or better safety measures, or do we want to, as far as the pressure they're having, rid those pressures by having us all do well together, or just completely defeat that rationalization by having kind of a PR campaign and getting across to them that you can't do this? Like, where where do we want to put more of the emphasis? Well, um, the FBI actually has a a, a partnership, a public-private partnership called InfraGuard. Have you heard about InfraGuard? I have not, no. So InfraGuard, again, is a partnership, public-private partnership, where we work, meet, train, research, collaborate with corporations uh, and entities, uh, uh, universities, to talk about the intellectual threat. Uh, of people trying to steal um, our technology. And we work together with them on a very close basis, giving them ideas and tips and thoughts about how to protect our intellectual property. Uh, it's, um, it's a big organization. They have chapters you know, all over the country. Again, it's InfraGuard, and uh, hmm. these are relationships that we have with private and public uh, organizations in order to, to safeguard. And it's uh, very, very effective. That's good to hear. I think that's that's critical that we have that because 
I, I often ask people, like, is globalization a good thing or a bad thing right now? And it's, I mean, you, I'd be happy to hear your opinion on it too, because it, it seems like it's here. There's no stopping it. Um, we're, we're getting the world's becoming a smaller and smaller place by the day. Uh, so that's all, there's obviously so much good there, but it's almost like there's no more keeping someone at bay when they're already here, you know? Right. Glo I think glo globalization is a good thing, but stealing is never a good thing. And sure. so if I'm going to put my money and energy into developing a technology, then I don't want you to come and steal it from me and take advantage of my particular hard work. And that's what we're talking about. Yeah, yeah, well, definitely. I, I would encourage, you know, organizations and companies to share their technology with, you know, globally. But someone's going to have to pay. Someone should pay for that. They should. Yeah. They should. Yeah. And, and so that's really the difference. It's not about not wanting to share. It's not wanting someone to steal our, um, you know, our technology, you know, without mm -hmm. the United States or particular private entity, be, entity being compensated for. Got it. Got it. And so kind of the, the grand question of, question of them all, uh, if you could change one thing about the world today, what would it be? Uh, you know, again, since I, I hate discussing this, I would, I would have to say, you know, the politics. You know, I wish we had an opportunity to maybe even have a, a third um, uh, political, you know what I'm saying. What's the word? Party. I yeah, like party or right candidate. There. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. I, I would love for us to be able to have, you know, a third party so that we have an opportunity not to be so black and white about mm -hmm. our particular viewpoints and, and goals, because what politics has done you know, to this country is just so sad on both sides, you know, both sides. Mm -hmm. um, I, I just don't know what, what's going to happen, you know, to the world uh, as we know it, if we don't get back onto some type of more um, kindness and away from the ugliness and the, you know, the dividing of, of, um, of goals, you know, for this country. I, I, I think that would be, that would be the biggest thing that I would like to see is sure. uh, us coming together more as a country. Yeah. And I, I think if there was ever a time for that third party, you got to think that we're kind of getting closer to it where, I mean, we are just going to so far opposite ends of the spectrum here that I, I don't think the average Joe likes that. And, and I hope, no. and I like to believe that, that we'd rather be more kind of getting along than getting apart. Oh, absolutely. And again, yeah. you know, on, on, on my show, I've talked to agents and I know that they may have different political, you know, opinions than mine, but, you know, working with them, I've become friendly with so many people that I know don't share my viewpoints. And I think that's what is wrong or, or troubling today is that there are many situations where that doesn't happen. You know, that we're not allowing people to have their different opinions and, you know, we're, we're, we're rejecting people because of it. Um, and that's, that's not going to be good. That's not going to be good for our country. I agree. And so the, the last question for you to get to know Jerry Williams that just and this is one I wanted to know, you know, myself, I'm a financial advisor and author and podcaster. And I feel like each one has kind of brought about its own excitement and also a uh, feeling of, of kind of doing good and reaching different people. You yourself, you're an FBI special agent and now author and podcaster. Of those three that going back to triangles, that seems to be the theme today. Do you have, I guess, two things. Which one was your favorite of those three roles? And where do you feel like you've done the most good? Now, as a retired agent, you know, who worked there for 26 years, I definitely feel that that was the most spectacular thing that I've done in my life. And remember that the last five years, four to five years of my FBI career, I became the spokesperson for Philadelphia. I was the person that dealt with the media and dealt with, uh, other, with the public on what the FBI was doing in Philadelphia. So I kind of took on that responsibility of wanting to uh, shape 
the perception, the positive perception of the FBI. And what happened mm. is that after I retired, that kind of became my um, my hobby. And I continue doing that as a podcaster. I only interview uh, retired FBI employees on my podcast, which is called FBI Retired Case File Review. And I love podcasting. Um, I've been doing it for eight years. It was eight years in January. Well, so good for you. that would be second. And then third uh, would definitely be writing. I, I love writing. I write a blog post. I only write one a month, but what I usually do is review a TV show or movie that features the FBI. And I look for teachable moments about FBI policy or procedures in those entertaining movies and TV shows because what most people know about the FBI, they get from books, TV, and movies. Sure. And so, um, yeah, so in that order, the best thing was being uh, an FBI agent. You know, again, yeah. I'm retired many years ago, but taking that knowledge, trying to stay relevant uh, and using it in podcasting and in, in writing. That's I love awesome. What I do, love. Yeah, I Absolutely. could see that. Mm -hmm. That's that's awesome, and I know we we all appreciate that too. So I can't let you go quite yet, Jerry, because we do have the lightning round. I know for a lot of my listeners, this is their favorite part of the whole show. <laughs> okay, uh, we'll see. I'll just ask you some <laughs> questions here, get to know you better, and then you tell us the first thing that comes to mind. Okay. So first up, what did you want to be when you were growing up? A doctor. A doctor. Okay. And who was your hero as a child? Oh, my father. Okay. And uh, do you have a favorite book? Uh, right now, my favorite book is John Gresham's The Testament. And it's not one of his most fa fa uh, famous, but I absolutely love that book. So John Testament. Gresham's The Testament. Okay. And do you have a favorite movie? Hmm. <laughs> this is a shame, but it probably would be The Firm. Again, you know, I love fraud and, and, and corruption. And so uh, John Gresham's book that was turned into a movie well, with, uh, uh, what was his name? Um, the actor. Uh, was it Tom Cruise? Yeah, the Tom film? Cruise. Uh, okay. That's, that's probably one of my favorites, too. I'll probably think later about, uh oh. Yeah, I right see now, a common thread here. Yeah, yeah, you do, don't you? <laughs> yep. And do you have a quote to live by? Um, when people show you who they are, believe them. And that's a Maya Angelou uh, quote. Love it. And what's the first thing you do when you wake up in the morning? <sighs> Sit down on my computer and get to work. Yeah. So you get right at it. Yeah, there may be times that I realize it's 11 o'clock and I haven't changed out of my nightgown, but... <laughs> yeah, I get right to work. Okay. And I know you've you've been all over the place with your career. Do you have a favorite destination or vacation? Oh, I travel a lot. You know, this last year alone we went to Australia and New Zealand and Brazil and Argentina. Um, wow. Favorite. I really liked Aruba. In Paris. No, 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 I back up. My favorite destination was Prague. It really Prague. was. I don't, yes, Prague. I love Prague. I, was, it I was love it. Fabulous, fabulous city. Yep. I studied abroad there, got to live there for four months. Oh, so. Okay. So you know, yeah. it's just wonderful. Yeah. Yep. It's and I can so attempt much, to that. They retain so much of their uh, infrastructure and historical. A uh, lot of uh, European countries were bombed during the different wars. Mm -hmm. And for some reason, they were able to keep a lot of of their infrastructure and so it was just fantastic to, to be there yep. the people were great i love rock yeah i could agree 100 percent. it's a beautiful city but uh jerry thank you so much for making the time today this was a great conversation a lot of insights here on the fbi and, and your career uh, so thanks again jerry it was a pleasure to be here thank you for having me yep and everyone, thank you again for tuning in to the Kaderna podcast. I'm your host, Brian Kaderna. Today, we had the pleasure of speaking with Jerry Williams. Again, I'll put her info in the show notes. Be sure to check it out. And wherever you're listening or watching, please subscribe and leave us a review. We'll see you next time.
This podcast is intended for the general public and for informational purposes only. The show does not provide any recommendations or investment advice regarding any specific account type, service, strategy, or product, or to otherwise act in any fiduciary or other capacity. Please contact a financial professional for guidance and information that is specific to your situation. Brian Kaderna does not provide tax or legal advice. Please contact your accountant or legal advisor to discuss your situation. Guest speakers and their firms are not affiliated with or endorsed by Park Avenue Securities, Guardian, or Kaderna Financial Team, and opinions stated are their own. All investments contain risk and may lose value. Past performance is not a guarantee of future results. References to specific securities, asset classes, and financial markets are for illustrative purposes only and do not constitute a solicitation, offer, or recommendation to purchase or sell a security. Brian Kaderna is a registered representative and financial advisor of Park Avenue Securities, LLC, PAS, OSJ, 300 Broadacres Drive, Suite 175, Bloomfield, New Jersey, 07003, phone number 973-244-4420. Securities products and advisory services offered through PAS, member FINRA, SIPC. Financial representative of the Guardian Life Insurance Company of America, Guardian, New York, New York. PAS is a wholly owned subsidiary of Guardian. Hederna Financial Team is not an affiliate or subsidiary of PAS or Guardian. California Insurance License Number 0K04194.